and I can edit out my faux pas. YouTube's probably crashing from all the crypto live streams talking about prices or something. Okay, you're recording? Yep. Perfect. Um, all right. <clears throat> this is the Permissionless Software Foundation Community Committee meeting. It's May 5th, 2021. I am Chris Troutner. Um, I helped found the Permissionless Software Foundation with a few of the people here and a few of the people who aren't here. Um, let's go around and do just a, a brief introduction. David, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, David R. Allen. I'm helping Chris with the business development for the Permissionless Software Foundation. Daniel, why don't you go ahead and give an introduction? Hey, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm a software developer uh, working in the Permissionless Software Foundation. Yeah, Aaron, you want to give an intro? Uh, my name is Aaron Shoemaker. Um, I'm working on some development with uh, PSF and uh, to integrate NFTs and 3D digital assets. Stoyan, why don't you introduce yourself? My name is Stoyan Jekov, and I'm uh, helping with uh, supporting the JavaScript libraries with the Permission Software Foundation. It's all for me. Excellent. And we might have a couple other people join in later, um, drop in on the meeting. Let me go ahead. Oh, uh, David, can you enable sharing? Uh, that's a good question. It should be under, I think, security or. Can you just try and share now? Yeah, sure. Um, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. It does that by default. You have to. I don't seem to have that. Oh, here it is. Multiple participants. Merit, uh... Hmm. All participants, yeah. Okay, never seen that before. There we go. Yay. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> these community committee meetings are focused on the community rather than the technical steering committee, which more focuses on the technical stuff. So if anybody's been watching our technical meetings, they know that we are covering quite a bit of ground uh, pretty quickly. We're working on a lot of different things. Um, things are really popping and, uh, and I love it. So um, this, I didn't really have, uh, you know, specific things to, that I wanted to bring up uh, in this meeting. So I, I kind of took a poll of the community and said, you know, like here, here are some things that are on my mind. Do you guys want to talk about this stuff? And I got some positive responses. So as far as the agenda goes, uh, this is this is the agenda. We're just going to have a roundtable discussion this meeting, and uh, uh, basically, uh, from what I've noticed talking with the other members of the community, is like the the PSF is essentially a consortium of businesses that come together to fund common infrastructure that that we all depend on and we all have in common, and um, the, the 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 members with with more skin in the game get more say over over what we focus on and uh and so as we're growing so every everyone everyone who's in this community has their own self-interest um as they should and but we have common interests and where we come together on and uh so we're growing we're 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 pushing the state of the art in a lot of a lot of ways uh around crypto and um, particularly around NFTs and, um, and cross blockchain transfer of assets. Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting and, and, and more people with money to fund development um, are paying attention to what we're doing. And, uh, but the, the biggest bottlenecks to our growth that I'm noticing really comes down to two things. One is quality control or quality assurance QA for short, um, as well as uh, project management, which is uh, 
kind of an overused term. So when I'm, when I use it, I mean more someone who basically just babysits a project. They're not necessarily doing the work. They're responsible for making sure the work gets done and gets done properly to a high quality and is like on schedule. And, you know, just the person who is responsible for keeping the ball rolling. And uh, th those seem to be where we've, we've, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for developers. Um, we've got a couple that we're, we're trying to, to bring on in. And, um, uh, you know, when you grow, when you grow as an organization, um, you grow in several different regards at the same time. Um, so there are other things that, that we also are focusing on in terms of growth, but, but the bottlenecks really seem to be QA and project management. Uh, if we could, if we could come up with a way to find quality project managers, incentivize them, and trust them to take on a project, uh, we could we could grow a little faster. Like we, there's there's money there. That seems to there, there's money in the industry to work on these common goods. Um, if we could solve these sort of two problems, and then of course QA is uh, I take it for granted. It's a little self-explanatory, but essentially. Um, you know, developers don't always get it right on the first try. And so, and so QA is all about just uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, making sure, you know, okay, well, maybe this code works, but maybe, you know, the actual user interface that the user works on, uh, you know, breaks for some reason. So there's, there's always, there's always like multiple pieces and QA is usually concerned with making sure all the pieces play nicely together. Um, and so, I just kind of want to open it up to you guys. Uh, it, it, it seems like we could scale if we could um, come up with a better way to um, encourage people with these skill sets uh, to join our community. Um, neither one of them are really like a junior type thing. They require experience, uh, which, is, which is part of the reason why it's hard to find these people. I mean, this is not a unique to us. Every, every company has these problems. Um, and uh, even though we're not a company, but we have we have these problems, um, so I'll I'll leave it up I'll, I'll leave it open to you guys. Do you have any thoughts on how we can scale and attract people with with these skill sets? Uh, David, I saw your hand go up. Sure. Yeah. Just a, a quick observation um, within within the BCH and uh, uh, BCHA community, but also within the um, AVEX community. We're starting to see people who have experienced older people, boomers, uh, or not quite that old, who uh, are looking for a place to contribute. And I think reaching out within those communities is is probably the best way we can do it. I've always found this kind of communication works best when we go one on one. Um, and um, so I just encourage people to get in touch with us individually, and then. Uh, you know, point them in the right direction, have the conversation and see what skill sets come along. And um, sometimes the incentive isn't money. Um, it's um, opportunity to contribute. And um, so those, but those incentives still have to be aligned. And those are the things you find out by having one-on-one -on -one conversations. So that's the, you know, as far as recruitment for PSF projects uh, and projects within all the ecospheres is it's, it's always important to have the people who bridge the gap between marketing and and uh, programming, and uh, I think that's what a project manager generally does. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really important point that project managers don't necessarily need to be a developer or or even even that technical. Um, they need to be able to communicate with technical people. That's an important skill. Uh, but they don't naturally need to be very technical themselves. They, they just need to be able to understand when a project is functioning correctly and, or when it's gone off the rails. Well, you know, Aaron, um, you're kind of our newest um, community member um, that's got a little skin in the game. And um, I think it would, might be really helpful for, for me and for anyone watching this to just sort of, if you kind of, at a high level, can you just go over what attracted you to the PSF? What actually got you to take the step to reach out and, well, and participate? 
Um, I guess there's two things. Number one, I, I love the philosophy. Uh, I love uncensorable, uncensorable publishing. I love uh, uncensorable APIs and um, people being able to, tra to transact over the internet without being stopped. Uh, I, when Amazon pulled down Rumble uh, in January, I was a little alarmed because I'd spent the last year learning the AWS architecture so I can uh, make virtual tour websites for my clients. And, you know, just the possibility of, okay, I can make this, this website for them and then they could lose it somehow, you know, because I, I don't see that stuff as like, oh, this is just the extremes. I see they usually start with the extremes and then they move on to, oh, well, you're just kind of in my way, you know, I'm going to get you out of here kind of thing. And so that's why I started looking into like IPFS and things of that nature. Uh, and I found a good marriage between that and the, the token technology that you're working on, uh, because I also see merit in the NFTs uh, in being a future for uh, markets of digital assets. And right now, I think that the general consensus of the public is three things. One, it's I don't know what M NFTs are. Two, it's NFTs are really cool and they're the future. And three is NFTs are ridiculous. And I think there's a way to change the minds of one and three in that situation and show that there is value and uh, finding ways to be able to lock them up for personal use. And then at that point, I'm very excited about the possibility of uh, you could have a, shared experiences like you could use a multi-sig wallet to lock up an nft and then uh only be able to access it with three of your friends and so now this is a collective experience online that you wouldn't normally be able to have you know stuff like that is really interesting to me yeah does that answer the question <laughs> yeah 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 i mean i so it's to to sort of take what you said and extrapolate it i think at a at a more general level um, it seemed, and I've noticed this too over the last three years that I've been involved in the Bitcoin cash space is it's like, um, as a culture, um, the things that I've observed in Bitcoin, in Bitcoin in general over the last 12 years, uh, but also Bitcoin cash specifically over the last three years is we have these, these moments, like where we have forks and stuff where we lose chunks of devs, but we're always constantly getting this influx of people, not just developers. Um, because things like NFTs or um, cash shuffle or, uh, you know, SLP tokens, these new tech come and all of a sudden, like the light bulb goes off in people. And so they don't really know what it is, but they want to know more. And that sort of sucks them in. So in a general way, it sounds like the, the, this, this, the NFT thing scratched an itch that you had. You started looking into it. And uh, you found you found you were attracted to IPFS and and you know low transaction fees and and the, yeah. the sort of encryption type stuff. That I mean, Bitcoin is the, the protocol with a big B is is simpler um, than a lot of the other on chain stuff. So it's it's a natural place to gravitate towards if you're just trying to wrap your head around the possibilities. But, so, yeah, and I got into this in uh, 2016, <laughs> 2017. I mean, I was told about it way back in like 2011 and I wish I would have bought in there like everybody else, you know, and, uh, but I got into it in 2016, 2017 and really started researching and uh, I, the, the crash happened and I still followed it. I was still kind of on the back burner, but I saw a lot of development going on in that time. And it's similar to, I, I'm into 360 and VR stuff. When I first looked at that, like maybe three years ago, I was like, ah, oh, this is pixelated. It doesn't look that good, you know, but the speed at which it's developed is incredible. And now, you know, there's a, a 12K stereoscopic ca camera that just got, that's being released in this month, you know, and j to put that in perspective, you 16k is like real life so it's getting really really close and uh i see the same in the crypto sphere where these technologies are getting really really close to breaking open 
into the wider market and having a really good use case. I mean, they already have a good use case, but having people who are the average Joe's going, oh yeah, this is easy. Oh yeah, this is why I would use this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've, you've done a great job at that of, of, of opening our eyes of like, hey, you guys, there's, there's this other tech and this tech, like let's, let's put them together. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's kind of the, where I'm excited and, and what we're doing uh, is saying, all right, digital assets can become this huge field because the 360 stuff, the VR stuff is blowing up and that's about to, like you can consider that like Bitcoin in 2014, 2015, uh, as opposed to where Bitcoin is now, you know, and I say Bitcoin in, in general because the general public thinks crypto and they think Bitcoin and maybe Ethereum, you know, mm -hmm. and then you get less and less that think everything else. But I think they're starting to see the use cases in the other cryptos right now as well, as you know, you're seeing these pump a little bit right now. And as we speak, we have a lot of speculators, but not a lot of utilitarians, you know, right. Uh, and there's beginning to be more utilitarians in the crypto space. And the, I see the same stuff with VR and being able to marry the two, this, this digital asset creation with cryptography, mm -hmm. I think is a match made in heaven. You know, something you touched on there, I think is really important for this topic that we're talking about of, of how do we grow our community in general, but more specifically, like people with specific skill sets. The pattern I've noticed is that most of the building actually happens during bear markets, not during bull markets. During bull markets, everyone's chasing hype and they're so busy just talking and trying to understand like what's happening that uh, it's hugely distracting to the actual utilitarian building. Um, yeah. but it's those bull markets that, that get, you know, that wake people up and, and be, and, and make them aware that, Hey, there's something going on over here that you should be aware of. But then, and so I, I think this is the pattern that we just have to embrace. Cause I, it's, it's been around for over a decade. It's probably going to continue into the foreseeable future where we have these cycles and that's the cycle. Like people, people, we have an influx of new blood during the bull market but then it's the bear market where you separate the wheat from the chaff and the actual like builders, the people who really see utilitarian value, yeah. that's when they hunker down and they really start working on it. So maybe that's just the pattern as a community that we need to embrace. Um, and, I, uh, I would agree. I, and I think that uh, another thing to add there is when the everybody's going after the hype, it is very important to stay steady and keep your nose to the grindstone. Because if you abandon your work to go after the hype, when the cra when that crash happens, like you're saying, like it'll probably dip back down for a while, you're left scrambling instead of saying, all right, we've come out of this with this new product, which is great. And if people embrace that, like you're saying, we can come out of this thing with products and maybe the dip ha doesn't have to go so far because it starts to dip. And then the new product comes out and people go, oh, this is another utilitarian thing. And what we get is instead of big swings, we get little stair steps all the way up to global acceptance, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Well, well said. Well said. Uh, does anybody else want to add anything before we move on? Let's talk more, talk more about the PCF stuff. Not so common stuff. So like how to see for the quality for QA, for example, what, what you want to do to, ah, sorry, my camera was off. Do you want to pay to more unqualified testers like to have a bounty for founding a bug or you want to pay to one very qualified tester like he know how to use tools and stuff. We need to decide maybe this kind of stuff and it's pretty good even now because there's a lot of uh, automatic testing now. Mm -hmm. Everything is almost covered. So it will, for example, for testing interfaces, like there's several like uh, uh, React stuff, like wallet and stuff. For this one, it cannot be covered with this automated testing. So there will be need from some testers, but I mean, 
we need to decide what you want like one high qualified guys who will get something for testing or you can just put a bounty who found the book get some like tcf tokens yeah thank you Stoyan, for for yeah. pointing that out because and that, for that... project management also i'm not sure is it even needed somebody to manage so much the stuff because it's still not so big I, i'm sure maybe it will become more but in the moment there's i think less than 10 developers working in this one so if we decided to do more like agile style of working there's no need from some like very uh management there everybody get a task solve the problem mm -hmm. and what what style of management agile agile stuff or waterfall like oh i mean like uh, somebody will create all of the interfaces and just give a small mm -hmm. task to somebody else and they will report like up to hierarchy or everybody mm -hmm. will just get the tasks from the pool of tasks and commit there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what kind of style we will go for in, in the management in both cases will be different. Maybe you need some project owners right. maybe for the this agile stuff, like some project owner for the wallet, some project mm -hmm. owner for the API. It's not need to be you for everything. They, they, these right. project owners, they will create the, the stories. Like we need this, this, this. And they will examine it other tasks like up to the story. Yeah, so yeah. In these cases, I'm not sure. There's, I'm not sure if they can be very non-technical. It's better to be a little technical guys doing this job. Yeah, I mean, you 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 nailed exactly what I'm trying. So it's it's a little it's hard to talk in a general terms because a lot of the because the, the specifics are really what we need to get to, and um, yeah. So it, on so let's talk about QA um, first. Uh, one of one of the, the the big bottlenecks there with QA that I'm noticing is really code review. Um, is it's it's just it's it's really easy to get into an unhealthy uh place if if you let just a single developer push code and, and i i'm this is i've seen this happen with me i i get my stuff into a bad place where no one is it's so i'm so deep into it that i can't get another developer um interested in it because because there's just so much there and uh and so when i find that when someone reviews my code or when i review other people's code um I mean, not only does it catch bugs, but it also just now there's two people who understand what's going on and can explain it to other people. And, um, you know, so right there, you've uh, you've improved it by 50 percent in terms of uh, conceptually digesting it. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to, to figure out is how can we I do pretty much all the code review. Uh, and as a result, I do very little coding these days. Um, so that's in terms of QA, that's the problem I'd really like to see us solve is how can we set up a system that involved that, that where we can take the devs that we already have and incentivize them and, and come up with a system where, where we're all sort of reviewing one another's code. And part of what makes that difficult is that we have so many different projects. Uh, and so there's not a lot of overlap like um you know if, if one person's working on trying like if if someone's working on you know an avalanche thing they're probably not the best person to uh review like bitcoin cash code uh and uh and right now because we have so few developers everyone's kind of highly specialized so that's that's kind of why why i think we're struggling with trying to achieve this code review overlap um one and then way, we can talk about project management. But let's yeah. talk about that. One way which is uh, for solving this problem, but I'm not sure how doable is it, uh, is to, to not do uh, pull request review, but to have live coding together. Yeah. Like, pair coding uh, is mm -hmm. one of the ways to, to solve these problems because the people from different projects, usually the one who is not very good in this like avalanche guy, he will be the, the coder and somebody will just do this, do this, do this. Pair programming will increase the, the how to see the level of the whole group, but it's very difficult for the like for company, we're doing this, but for, for the 
this kind of uh, very distributed group, I'm not sure if we can achieve it. Right. But it's one way, just to have uh, like uh, fair coding. Yeah, I mean, that's been exactly my, I mean, I've said exactly the same thing is like, yeah, I, I think pair coding has, you know, there's, there's an answer there. I don't know if we can take advantage of it based on how we're structured. Yeah, we can search for the tools for the, this job because everybody's now trying to do this remotely. So mm -hmm. there should be a way to, to right. achieve this. So it's one way. In this case, there will be more people looking on the same code Mm -hmm. So it will increase. That's really what we need when it comes down to it. We just need more people sort of looking at the code, giving critical feedback. Um, and, and also in terms of the workflow, I'm not sure. Like, you know, if we stick to the GitHub workflow, you submit a pull request and then, you know, someone reviews the code and approves it before it gets merged. That's the GitHub workflow. But again, I don't know if that workflow works very good with our, with our distributed team having people what I've seen in companies where they've tried to do this, where like, say you get a front end guy doing a code review for a back end guy. Well, they're trying to work on their own project to begin with. Uh, so they're crunched for time. They don't really understand what's going on. So they just sort of hit approve and like, okay. And then, um, so it's not a real code review. Uh, it's really just going through the motions. Um, so that's what I don't want us to do. Okay. Um, you can put maybe a, a limit of at least two people to make the pull request review and then to be merged. In this case, even one of the guys keep the, <laughs> the real look, maybe the other one will look on this one. So do not approve uh, merging without at least two, two? reviews. Hmm. Maybe okay, more a reviews. little will increase the, the quality. You know that might actually solve the problem. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it slows everything down, um, but in some of these things, yes, speed's but, not the highest priority. Yeah, yeah. I think our call, we, we don't uh, look so much for the speed, I think. Most important is quality because like the, the boundaries are pretty flexible for the time, mm -hmm. but how to see, it's good to have less bugs. Because, right. yeah, applications are pretty critical money. So, <laughs> right, right. Urgency is the enemy of efficiency and quality a lot of times. So, our, so right now, if I understand it, you're doing a lot of the code review yourself, Chris. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking for ways to sort of hand that off. Um, I mean, there's, there's specific projects that, that I, I want to continue, that I'm passionate about. So I want to continue to focus it, but it's, it's the projects I'm not so passionate about, um, which are growing, um, that we need to, we need to find a, a good, a good solution to, to do these sorts of code reviews and, and, and ensure quality. Sounds uh, good. So you're, I you're, think Stoyan has some good suggestions yeah. there. I like that. Okay, well, I mean, this really is intended to be a conversation. Um, so we'll continue to have the conversation and, and ask ourselves these questions um, of how can we make it better. Um, but I want to return to uh, the other things that you were saying, Stoyan, about project management. Um, so you were saying like, yeah, the project manager doesn't necessarily need to be um, technical. And actually, can you, can you just uh, refresh me on some of the points that you were making about project management? Um, he has some good ones. My, my point was uh, how to see management seems somebody need to, to manage, right? So he mm -hmm. need to, uh, you do this, you do this, you, and you report to these people. But agile style of working is more like uh, the team, for example, have uh, like initial conversation with the, uh, with the project, uh, with the, this project owner. Like, for example, you want this one. So you will be this, uh, project owner. So mm -hmm. the team talk with you and you, I want this, 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 this. So we're creating story from these things and everybody from there starts working like individually. The, so one get this story, other. So there's not so much management involved in this case. Mm -hmm. 
So it's more flexible way. But the other way is like now you're creating all the tasks and you giving them to the people. So it's, well, everything is doable. But I mean, there must be some decisions like will be there this uh, project owners mm -hmm. or there will be just one project owner, you. Mm -hmm. And like we're talking, uh, it's not more about the technical re review of the code, but is the code uh, like uh, doing what is supposed to do? So mm -hmm. it, is it sticking to the story? Like for example, we want mm -hmm. user and password login. So you mm -hmm. check this one. You don't care is the JavaScript code inside so good. There is mm -hmm. the reviewers for this one. The project mm -hmm. owner is just looking on the, the goals. Mm -hmm. So and this, this is not so much about management, right? It's more about the reaching the goals. So, yeah, yeah. So I'm 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 more familiar with like the agile way of doing it. You've you've seen our Trello Kanban board, um, and so that's that's the style that I'm most familiar with. Um, is that essentially what you're describing, or is it? Can you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But how to see? They, everything is like how to see. Uh, different people, different organization using different styles. We just need to see which one is good for, for this organization. Like for example, somebody are using uh, uh, some very technical guy will create like uh, the, the upper level, like maybe the interface between the blocks and every not so technical, a little technical guys will just fill the blocks with code Mm -hmm. So this also is doable. We just need to see which one works for, for this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for our organ organization. And yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good feedback. I mean, I think this, this, uh, the, the, the project management side of things is, is something that I think is easier for us to solve in terms of, you know, as, as if someone comes to the organization and they're like, I'd really like to see, you know, X built. And uh, a lot of times I, I'm almost like, okay, well, then we'll work with you or you need to bring your own sort of project manager who, who answers to you, you know, so you have the funder and you have the project manager. And so you kind of get those two things like figured out at the beginning. Um, and then from there, it's just the typical software development and, and, you know, that's where we really need to solve the, the QA side of things. Um, that's that's kind of how I've been, I, I'm starting to look at it is um, the project management side of things, we, we kind of have to solve that up front. And, uh, and because it's up front, it's a little easier to solve. Um, whereas the QA thing is something that's more part of the process. And so we need to refine our process. Uh, does that make sense? Do you have any thoughts on that? We, we're talking, Daniel is not talking at all. So maybe we can hear another developer yeah. opinion yeah. on this one. Like, right. yeah, it's, uh, yes, it's process. We we mm -hmm. need to, to continue working on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let me just, uh, so the next, the next, thing in the agenda here is really like what are actionable steps that we can take I always like to ask that question at the end of a roundtable discussion and so what I'm hearing in terms of actionable steps is uh, you know in, in terms of the QA thing let's really explore the pair programming and maybe the idea of having two code reviews before a merge um, the, you know that that has the the implication of slowing things down, but also doubling the, 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 the quality control in terms of it, it's keeping, you know, I've seen, I've seen when you just have one reviewer, uh, I've seen that go into a, like, sort of you get a lazy reviewer, right? And so I've seen that like fall apart, but maybe with two reviewers, there's more incentive for honesty and effort there. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in maybe exploring that. And then on the project management side of things, um, I think the actual step there is is just to um, be a little more upfront uh, when we take on new projects in terms of 
uh, bring, uh, you know, just get, get, get the project management side of things nailed down up front uh, before you start the actual development process. Uh, does anybody else have any thoughts or, or did anybody else hear anything that's, that's actionable that we could do on these fronts? For well, these actionable steps, you can also maybe uh, reward reviews, not only coding, but also <laughs> reviewing code also to be rewarded in some way. I don't know, 10 PCF for review or something. I, uh, need I, was, I was just about to say that actually. Um, incentivization is a good tool and it could be an incentivization, an incentivization based on uh, does the code work well in the future, you know, too. And I don't know exactly how you go about that, but that would uh, really incentivize them to make sure the code, they review the code and the code is correct. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would um, measure that. Yeah. I mean, over that, the long term, it's obvious, but like in terms of a, a feedback for an incentive mechanism. Well, you could have an initial incentive, you know, so that uh, it's it's good, but then you could have a, a longer term incentive too, you know. Uh, it like uh, hitting a sales goal, you know, you got commission, mm -hmm. and then if you hit a sales goal, you get a bonus. So the the bonus drives them to actually sell more than if they just had a commission. So if you had an That's incentivization for uh, review. And then you essentially have a bonus should we not have any problems or have to come back to the code or, or pay a developer to redo it, you know, uh, there's an incentivization there too. That's an interesting idea. So, Ann, um, I just want to make sure I understand what you said. Um, can you repeat it or does that, does, did Aaron capture the, what your point? Uh I was thinking uh, in the moment there's the uh, let's see reward for the people who are coding, but not for this who are doing the reviews. If mm -hmm. there's like a small how to say reward for the just for doing the uh, review, then mm -hmm. maybe will be more people doing it, like the community people, not the coders mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, looking on the ready code, you can see some like uh, obvious errors. Mm -hmm. And this can be done by not so technical people. So we can grow community just by allowing uh, outside people to, to review this code and maybe get some small reward for it. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a, I mean, I can see some of the problems with that uh, in terms of like, uh, like I've tried to review like, like front end code that, it, and I'm not a front end developer. And so I get, I'm just like, I don't know what's going on. I'm not qualified to review this. Um, but uh, uh, so I'd be afraid of, of having unqualified people do reviews. No, I mean, but, they, um, they will I, not co completely unqualified. They will be, for example, the usual JavaScript developer. He can see this right. code. He will not understand maybe so much uh, deep about the unspent uh, UTXO, but he will know that, for example, this variable is not very good there or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, like more like common code reviews, right? Would be maybe good. I know. And okay. and and if we did two, if we had two reviews for uh, critical type stuff, that might catch it. Even yeah. if this the maybe this uh, these reviews will be with uh, less uh, uh, less stronger than the other coder review, maybe because. Just two non-technical guy reviews will be not maybe enough. Yeah, it's got to be merged. So An another that yeah that that's a good point. I, I think I think I think yeah, that's a you you and Aaron have both uh, those, those are both really good um, things that uh, I'll continue to think about. Let's collectively continue to think about. It. I think those might actually be the solutions to this problem. That's probably how we should move forward. Um, yeah. And just another thing to add there is it sounds like you're looking, you like the idea of uh, kind of outsourcing the code review a, in a way, but also you, you're wanting some way of quality assurance for those people we outsource to. And so that's a, that would be another problem to break down. How do we 
uh, assure that quality assurance, but also make it easy enough for people to do. Yeah, so that's actually an excellent segue because what I wanted to say that I haven't brought up or I, I forgot about until recently is uh, one of the things that I've also been trying to be better about is um, drafting up uh, a checklist for manual smoke tests. And this is where like you, you, you really can have someone who's non-technical uh, just go through the check. Like, so to give a concrete example, like wallet.fullstack.cash, I've started drafting up a checklist of a, sm a smoke test where it's like, okay, uh, send some money to the wallet, make sure the money appears. Uh, send a token to an address, make sure, you know, it can send and the token arrives. You know, just these, these sort of checklists of like, do this, do that, make sure this thing works. And so it, it, it's really not technical at all. You're not getting into the code. You're just basically going through the same motions that a typical user would do. And uh, at a company I worked at prior to this, we would do this type of smoke test like once a month um, on our products. Like some, someone uh, in the QA department would, do, would be assigned to, to do that. And uh, that ensures that you know everything's working the way we expect it to be working and that any recent code changes haven't broken it and it's it's a very high level type of QA activity where the and the advantages the person doing it does does not need to really know anything about the product or know any technical information i put one link in the chat uh we're using a, a free software for the mind mapping mm. it's named like this x map so it's exactly the thing that you are talking now about it's just creating a, a, like a small uh, schema of the these common tests, like do this, 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 do this, mm -hmm. this, this, this. So the tester every time just going through these steps, anytime he do the testing. Okay, so great. Maybe one possible how to see helpful yeah. tool to to have this mind map like schema that all testers can follow. Okay. Yeah. 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 Same. Same idea. I will check out that link. Yeah, I, and you can give it to not very technical people because they will just follow the the manual. Do this, 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 this. Right. Right. Okay. So good. That's another good thing. I, I these are great ideas, guys. I'm so glad that we're having this community discussion because um, you know I don't have all the I don't have all the answers. <laughs> this is great. And to uh, piggyback off of what Stoyan is saying, is there a way we might be able to implement something like uh, the message system you've already developed to uh, send messages when checklists are done for verification? Yeah, you're talking about using end-to-end -end encrypted messaging like on message.fullstack.cache? Yeah, yeah. So like Stoyan is saying you have this checklist. Okay, so you get the checklist done. You, you wrap it in a message, right? And send it out to uh, the PSF essentially. And then uh, it's real easy to go through and go, okay, yeah, they did this. Yeah, they did this. Yeah, they did this, you know? Uh, I... Yeah, it's all possible. Um, I don't know if it would be worth, we'd have to really think about whether it's worth the effort of doing it, of sort of rolling our own versus using existing tools for that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of throwing stuff out here because you know you still have the quality control issue of like, okay, we've got the checklist, but what if they just kind of say, yeah, I went through this, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and then you're- right. You're kind of stuck at the same problem of saying, well, how do we how do we assure that quality? Well, in the case of these smoke tests, that's why it's good. They should be done on a on a regular basis, like on a monthly basis. Um, okay. And then and then if a user uses the app and does this goes through the same thing and has a different experience, um, that's a pretty good indication that whoever did the last smoke test like didn't actually do it very well. Yeah. And. What about, uh, what if the user doesn't contact and you don't know that they had an issue and they just stopped using it? Well, you know, that's a good point. Um, I've noticed, where was I? I think I was, um, it was either the Bitcoin.com app or maybe it was the Explorer 
but I was somewhere using a crypto thing and there's a button at the bottom that said, you know, leave feedback. And I love that idea. I mean, it's pretty noisy, but I love the idea that like at any point, if someone's having like confused or having a bad experience, there's a button at the bottom they can click and like, and, and, and get it out and like describe the bad experience that they're having. Um, you know, not, like, I don't, I don't necessarily want to do that for developer tooling because developers are expected to have problems and to solve it uh, themselves. But for end user wallets or use end user applications where the user experience is critical, uh, I, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Do we have any end user testing right now? No. Well, I mean, uh, so as far as the stuff that I work on, um, the is is primarily developer tooling um so it's just hasn't been yeah. a focus of mine but um uh but but we are as a as a community we are starting to develop end user applications so that's more of a concern because mm -hmm. it sounds like uh you can have people that are reviewing the code and then once it gets to the point where there needs to be some end user uh feedback uh, maybe there be an incentive we can incentivize some average users with not as much knowledge to go through it and see what they think i mean yeah yeah i i know of one project that we're working on that uh, uh i don't want to talk too much about it because it's it hasn't been released yet but uh but i know that the the people in charge of heading that one up are are doing quite a bit of feedback and sort of uh limited release getting feedback like like moving moving slowly and, and checking the quality every step of the way yeah and so it's good that's a good model for for us to use we're gonna we're gonna grow from that so yeah i mean these are good questions and and they are being addressed um i just i all i work on is developer tooling so thankfully this the the end user i'm, I'm expecting my end user to be a little more um you know, knowledgeable because I'm, I'm they're, they're developers. So they're expected to yep. solve a few things on their own. But uh, yeah, good, good point, good question. Well, we can continue uh, this discussion if anybody else has anything to add. Otherwise we can move on to the, the final thing in the agenda, which is just to let's discuss sort of what trends are we seeing uh, that as a community we should we should be focusing on. Okay, well, let's let's move on to, to, to that question, these sort of industry trends. And um, I mean, I think the elephant in the room here is NFTs. And I think we're doing a really good job of, of focusing on that. I, I'm, I'm honestly, I'll, I'll say for a minute here that I'm really proud of this community of how we are building. We're focusing on the utilitarian use cases of NFTs. We're not chasing the hype. We're not trying to get out in front of the curve, which is a losing battle because uh, you know the hype always moves faster than you can build things. Uh, and we're really, we're, we're looking at, we're trying to cut through the, we've, we've done a good job, I think, of cutting through the noise and focusing on, okay, what's the infrastructure behind NFTs? Um, because that's the thing that needs to last over a period of time and will continue to last once the hype cycle completes. Um, so I think we've got NFTs like, in the bag, essentially, in terms of what what we're doing as a community, um, and the and the projects we're working on, uh, and then I've I've waxed poetic on how how much I like the this JSON RPC over IPFS that I'm working on. Um, I'm also fully cognizant that I'm probably the only person that has a full vision of of what's possible with it. Um, but uh, another um, what was the other trend I wanted to bring up? Well, and Aaron's doing a great job of, of sort of pointing out the, the VR um, side of things um, and how that can be combined with the NFT technology. Uh, also, I'm, I'm getting really excited about the C chain uh, on Avalanche, which is an EVM compatible, and, um, and then Smart BCH, which is an EVM compatible side chain for Bitcoin Cash. Um, which should also be able to work on eCash since since they're so similar. Um, so those are two. That's a 
if you know it, so right now as we're speaking, um, Bitcoin Cash is up like 30%. And if you look on coin market cap, you'll notice that Ethereum is like zero or possibly losing a little bit. And so what that is telling me is that is that people are fed up with the fees on Ethereum. They're looking at all these EVM compatible chains. Money is leaving Ethereum and it's moving towards places where they can run the same code on a different chain with, with lower transaction fees. Daniel, I, did I see your hand go up? No, so sorry, I was waiting. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so I think that that's a trend that we need. I mean, I, I might be wrong about that. That's just my speculation on the moment of the day. But um, I think that that's a trend that we need to be aware of and keep an eye on because I'm pretty sure that is a trend uh, that is forming. Is that uh, I have it, very mixed feelings on this uh, stuff because how to see this smart smart contracts they're like uh, too much uh, Ethereum like and how to see the, the the basic unity in the Bitcoin stuff is uh, scripts in the UTXOs so if you can do something smarter with them I think it's better but yeah. Trend seems I agree. to be smart BSH. Maybe we should talk more. Uh, very soon there will be some changes on 15, right? Will this bring us something new, like a community? Like, for example, the multiply Most op returns. returns. Yeah. What, what will give this? I think us? that's going to be a game changer. Um, yeah, I also am very excited. Yeah. But yeah. It's going to unlock a lot of. And so, so people who aren't you know, familiar, haven't been following. So after May 15th, uh, network upgrade on Bitcoin Cash, there's going to be a, allowed to have multiple op returns. So the op return is where you can put arbitrary text. And this is how SLP tokens yeah. work. Yeah. And, and so now you'll be able to do SLP tokens with additional metadata in the transaction, which you could never do before um, because you were only allowed to have one op return and that was taken up by the SLP data. Um, so the ability to send an SLP token and then add another protocol. So SLP is essentially a protocol on top of Bitcoin Cash that lives in the op return. And so if you have multiple op returns, you can now have an additional protocol on top of that. And that is a, that is a very general solution to a lot of problems. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's, it's going to be pretty, pretty big deal. Yeah, I was thinking so, from, from, from yesterday about what this can be done because in fact we can you cannot have two sop tokens in the same transaction in the moment because mm -hmm. the sop itself is searching only for the the first one right but you can attach media for example my bcp idea there mm -hmm. maybe you can attach i'm not sure like uh winner money's uh, idea about the swap protocol you can mm -hmm. attach some op returns with uh, selling or buying information. I don't know what else. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly right. Like those are those are two big things that you could do now. Huh. It will be good if you can attach two SOP tokens to have like atomic exchange will be great. But you ooh. know, it's funny is I was I. I tried to get this opportunity, this multiple opportunity thing, like probably a year ago or more than a year ago. I was, I was really trying to like rally at all the developers and be like, yeah, this is a good idea. We should do this. Um, and, uh, and I had a list of use cases. I'm going to need to see if I can put, find that. Um, cause, cause that was the question I kept getting asked in the dev meetings. It was like, well, what are, what are the practical use cases? You know, why should we do this? Why is this valuable? And so I actually had a list of all, all the valuable things you could do. Uh, and so I need to find that list because I completely forgot what was on it. Yeah, he will be, it will be very actual maybe now. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah I mean. You got my head spinning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to have I mean, to think about that. I'd one of the, see those use cases. One of the most obvious things you can do is like now you can attach 
you know, just general metadata, like this transaction was for, you know, five oranges or, you know, or whatever, uh, you know, just have a really common, but also the other thing that I like about Operator and I'm starting to get into is um, just a very simple JSON formatted, you know, piece of data, just, just JSON, just JSON string uh, that, that you can do all sorts of things like, uh, uh, well, like, so Aaron, we, we were talking recently about my specification for pointing to mutable data from an immutable token. Yeah. Like, like SLP tokens, transactions. I mean, this is not a good example, but for instance, an SLP transaction could have a link to the token icon in that second op return or just, you know, just some sort yeah. of piece of data, some additional, like this token, here's, here's the token, but this token refers to this other like whole another there's a pointer to a whole another like piece of data that that might be important like a video game character token icon or um, some related you know any any other kind of related piece of data so does the uh like the smart contracts functionality on bitcoin cash right now go in the op return uh no so the script bitcoin script is is that locking um uh the the locking script is essentially like so cash script is a is sort of a typescript way of writing like you can do escrow like for instance the escrow the blind escrow that local.bitcoin.com uses that's a locking script yeah. and so you have you have, it's, it's essentially a, a two of three multi-sig um and uh and, but but the difference being that like that third signature, the 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 actual escrow person, the one acting as arbiter, they they don't even need to be aware of the transaction unless there's a dispute, and they also can't okay. they they can't send the money to themselves. They can only send the money to the one of the first two parties, and that's yeah. that's critical so that like you know law enforcement couldn't force local.bitcoin.com to like you know take everybody's money. Yeah, or something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have to think of that. The multiple op returns does open a lot of doors. So, and I don't know much about the smart BCH EVM side chain that they're coming out with, but but what I have managed to gather is that um, that works with the op return. They essentially take a block, hash it. If I'm understanding it correctly, they take a block in the side chain, hash it, and then that hash goes into a. a the op return, and it can only be produced by a miner on Bitcoin Cash, um, and uh, and so that's how they sort of anchor. They periodically anchor the side chain into the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. So in terms of the actual like effect on the on the base blockchain, it's it's incredibly minimal because it's just this occasional op return. So it has very low impact on on the actual Bitcoin Cash chain. And then you can do all sorts of, you know, whatever you want on the side chain. And um, I'm also excited, like, even if Smart BCH doesn't have it all figured out, the fact that they've got the machinery working means that someone can fork it and, uh, and you know, make any tweaks they need to. to so, you know, I, I'm always skeptical of a first iteration. Uh, but, but the fact, but, but breaking that new ground opens the door to improvements. So that's pretty cool. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep, uh, keep an eye on it. Just the, I, I also, I'm, I'm very, I wouldn't say skeptical, but I'm, I think that the stakes are too high for most business applications trying to use a smart contract because once you launch it, you can't shut it down. That's not an option. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's what's led to a lot of money being lost is people interacting with these, uh, with these smart contracts that have bugs and it doesn't do any good if you know about the bug because you can't fix the bug once it's launched. All you can do is launch a new smart contract and try and tell everybody to use the new one. Um, but anybody who doesn't get the memo uh, gets screwed. And uh, so there's just, there's just a, a smart contracts are a slippery slope and it, I mean, they have their place. Um, but if you can do it, like with a regular JavaScript app, I think that from a business perspective, it's much more pragmatic to do it that way. But there are things like, like particularly like minting tokens uh, and, uh, and other like uh, um, DAO 
decentralized autonomous organization type operations, uh, those, those have reached a level of maturity over the years. And so the fact that we can combine the CVM on the Bitcoin Cash chain and on the Avalanche chain, uh, and that we can move tokens between the sort of Bitcoin, uh, you know, so the Avalanche has this X chain, which is very similar to like the Bitcoin protocol or the Bitcoin Cash blockchain, um, which is simpler and, and much more straightforward. And so from a business perspective, I like that. Uh, but the fact that we can move tokens between these more simpler chains to these EVM chains and back and forth uh, gives us a lot of flexibility in terms of solving business problems. So, so that's, that's my main focus. I'm not like rah, rah, EVM, you know, let's all learn solidity. Uh, but, uh, but it has its place. Does, uh, oh, do you want to add anything, David? No, I said it sounds good. I, I'm getting a bigger picture now and I think that's helpful. Cool. Yeah, it's um, okay. So we're going on about an hour. Um, but is there any other sort of industry trends that you guys think we should be paying attention to as a community? Fair enough. Okay, well, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm, I was saying, uh, I'm excited about the, the cross chain stuff. I think that's really exciting. Um, I, I'm also excited about the use case of uh, SLP tokens and NFT tokens as digital souvenirs. And I think there's uh, a use case for that. I think, David, if I'm not right, uh, you guys are kind of working on something like that. You know, and, and we talked about being able to do digital trophy rooms, uh, so to speak, in a wallet. And I, I these are things that I think are gonna attract the average consumer to start utilizing the, this sort of technology. You know, there's there's stuff that is, attracts technical people and then there's stuff that attracts the average consumer. And the things like digital souvenirs become a real easy thing to use. And then uh, eventually combining those with uh, using SLP tokens for discounts, uh, you could create a very easy way where you pick up a digital souvenir and you show it to a restaurant in town, and then that restaurant it shows you discount tokens for your lunch. You know, mm -hmm. it's not a super complicated idea. I mean, it's already been done with like paper or you know from a centralized database. But this way, each person, each business could determine how much they're in, uh, how much of a discount they give. Um, people could determine the type of souvenirs they give, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's very much in line with the geodrop.cash game that Daniel and I built for the hackathon where um, these it was similar to Pokemon Go where it was a geographic scavenger hunt. And, and so, you know, the souvenirs is one idea, but also it was like the, the sort of canonical use case that we came up with was like a coffee shop dropping like free coffee or free bagel tokens around their, their neighborhood. And then people could collect yeah. them and then redeem them. But Aaron, since you're on the phone uh, or on the call here um, and you, you have more experience than I do with the VR stuff, one of the things I, I want to look into is this idea behind um, displaying an NFT in the virtual world. Like I'm, I'm fascinated. I know, I, I know that when you put on like the Oculus uh, headset, you start in like a room that you create. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the thing I've been thinking a lot lately is like, how can we get like a virtual painting on the wall that is an NFT? I think that would be a huge, do you have any thoughts on like mechanically how, like what is available to do that these days? Like what, what would, what would it take to do something like that? Well, you would have to design it in unity and upload it to Oculus. So, um, and what it would what it would be, and I've been thinking about this because uh, this is my next use case for the NFTs is how do we bring NFTs into video games as use cases? And um, one of my thoughts was uh, utilizing HD wallets in a way uh, to create child addresses, uh, and that, that's a 
as a little bit more in depth on that, but uh, the basic gist is the asset has to live on someplace like an IPFS network, right? And the NFT becomes the key to unlocking the asset. And so you would create a program within the Oculus that, uh, that ha essentially has the keys. And that's why I'm saying you could use uh, children keys uh, or grandchildren keys as a way to unlock these assets or variations of the assets. And now that I know about multiple op returns, I, I think there's another use case there. Uh, and then it would essentially function like an API call or it would call out to the asset and then load the, the asset uh, real time in your viewer. And so you would then, and the asset would uh, likely exist as what's called an OBJ file, which is used for 3D printing and for, uh, and for video games now. So uh, it's got traffic here, sorry. And what's nice about that is it gives you tangibility of the asset. So you can essentially pick the asset up in your virtual world. And because that's where I see a lot of this happening is right now. Uh, David, you, Oculus, when you put it on the home screen is school, it, you, you, but then your uh, interactive interactability with the environment is through basically a monitor, like a computer screen, mm -hmm. which I don't think makes it sense at all for a VR application. You're in VR, your interaction should be like walking around a world instead of pulling up an application that says store, you should walk into a store, you know, mm -hmm. instead of. Uh, pulling up a media file location, you should walk into a movie theater, you know, and be able to take things like that. And that's why I think NFTs, there's there's a use case, it's going to have to be developed where you create the object, like the digital artwork, and you create a program that people can load onto their Oculus or their headset that calls that object and populates it within their their sphere of view, as it's called in VR. And, mm -hmm. you know, does that make sense? No, <laughs> but but the fact that it makes sense to you is good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there there is totally a way to do that, and uh, like all that he said, there's totally a way to do that. And the only difference where NFTs come in is they allow you the ability to sell that asset and somebody else can put that in their virtual world mm -hmm. and load that into their virtual world. And right now it's, uh, it takes some programming, but eventually it, my hope is that it'll be really easy to use and the average user can buy an NFT and then it's there in their home screen or their trophy room or their virtual world, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like your idea of the multiple op return because, yeah, that's one of the things, you know, on a blockchain that allows microtransactions, you can actually use the blockchain as an API. Um, you don't need to, like, as opposed to like a REST API um, or any other type of API that would, you know, typically go over the internet, you can actually just communicate straight through the blockchain. So you don't, you don't care how they're connected to the blockchain. Uh, they just need to be connected to the blockchain and then and then you can pass data back and forth, um, including, you know, access control like, oh, yeah, you have the right to display this NFT. Yeah. So, yeah, multiple yeah. returns would definitely unlock that ability. Yeah. And uh, I'm that's that's some, when I'm thinking like child addressing. Uh, one thing I'm thinking is for a developer, you know, you can uh, give them the. Uh, the nft and they can use a child address while they're developing and then maybe use a parent address when they publish and hmm. so the parent address the game itself would uh be in a sense a wallet that would store the keys to the nfts the assets that are being used by the game so mm -hmm. you can so once it's published uh and say you download the file well you would also be downloading uh the keys to the nft asset that's specifically used in that game and then when you play the game, the game itself would call out to that asset to populate it within the, view, the, the video game or the VR world, essentially. Okay, okay. 
Yeah, cool, man. I I hope I I hope I can find the bandwidth to learn more about that. <laughs> yeah, but I'm I'm, we, I'm glad I'm glad that you see how to connect the dots. Yeah, I'm I'm excited about it, and so I'm I'm uh, working with some VR guys that are. Uh, there's a guy here in Omaha I'm going to be meeting with, and he's already developed a world and Unity where you can add and take away things. You know, basically you can construct a world, and it's not a far jump between making those objects NFT objects. And I was explaining that to him the other day, and he thought this is awesome. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can get to work on that. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, we're getting late. Let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap this meeting up. I, it's been incredibly productive, and uh, I really appreciate your input because uh, you know this whole QA and project management thing is something that's been weighing on my mind, and I think we've managed to come up with uh, uh, several actionable ideas. Um, so I look forward to moving forward with those. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. Okay, Thanks, I think Chris. we can wrap it up from there. You guys have a good day. Bye-bye.